laser has wide variety of applications. From the presentation pointer to missile guidance and from hair therapy to eye surgery. As we know, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. To give you a brief history of lasers, in 1917, Albert Einstein proposed the idea of stimulated emission of photons. In 1954, Charles Townes demonstrated the first maser, M stands for microwave. And finally, in 1960, Theodore Mayman developed the first ever laser. Now, let us look at the principles on which the laser works. These are the processes associated with laser. They are stimulated absorption, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission and population inversion. At first, the stimulated absorption. We have a nucleus of some atom here. It has neutrons and protons. Around this nucleus, we will have electrons. It will not be in orbit like this. Rather, it will be a cloud of electrons around the nucleus. However, for explanation purpose, let us consider the Bohr's orbit model. Atoms can be at lower energy levels or higher energy levels depending on the energy it has. Every atom has a ground state which is stable and an excited state which is unstable. If a single photon of some energy comes across an atom in lower energy state, the atom will absorb the energy from the photon and goes to the excited state. The energy of the photon should be exactly equal to the energy difference between the two energy levels. Anything less or anything more, atom will not go to that particular energy state. This is the stimulated absorption. We are sending the photon to make an atom go to the excited state. Now, we'll move on to the next concept, the spontaneous emission. The atoms will fall back to the ground state within a short period because all the elements in the universe tend to be at the stable and the ground state. The atom stays for about 100 nanoseconds in the excited state before it comes back to the ground state. In this process, it will release the photon. The energy of the photon will be equal to the energy it had consumed during the excitation. This process will occur without any external help spontaneously. Hence the name is spontaneous emission. The next process is the one which has made the laser what it is today. The stimulated emission. We saw that how we can excite a ground state atom to reach the excited state. It stays there for a brief period and comes back. In stimulated emission, we will send another photon to hit the atom in a higher energy state and make it come back to the ground state. Similar to the spontaneous emission, the atom will release the photon. The unique property of this photon is that it will be in the direction of the incident photon. This will act like photon twins. This is the major difference between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission. The photon released in spontaneous emission can go in any random direction, whereas the photons released in the stimulated emission will travel in the direction of incident photon. This is the key feature of laser. But there is only one problem now. The atom stays in the excited state for few nanoseconds. This window is too small for the photon to interact and achieve the stimulated emission. So what is the solution? Yes, the metastable states. It is a particular excited state of an atom, nucleus or other system that has a longer lifetime than the ordinary excited states. If the highest energy state has a lifetime in nanoseconds, then the metastable states will have a lifetime in the range of milliseconds. This is much better window to make the photon to interact with the atom. So, the atom gets excited and reaches the higher energy state and then it comes to metastable state. To utilize the stimulated emission, we need to have more number of atoms in the metastate. However, if we look at the state of atoms of some materials, only half of them will be in the excited states at the most. We need to do a population inversion here. 
it is a state of the system at which the population of a particular higher energy state is more than the specified lower energy state. To understand population inversion, let us consider three energy states of an atom such as E1, E2 and E3. E1 is the ground state, E2 is the meta state and E3 is higher energy state. So E3 is greater than E2 and E1. If we supply the required energy to an atom in the E1 state, it will go to the higher energy state E3. As E3 is the higher unstable state, the atoms will come back to the ground state within a short period. Few atoms may move into the metastable state. The atoms in the meta state will stay there for longer periods than in the E3 state. So, the population of the atoms in E2 state increases gradually. As the process continues, we reach a stage where the population of E2 state is more than the population of E1 state. This is known as the population inversion. In lasers, when we have a population inversion, more number of atoms will undergo stimulated emission and release more number of highly directional photons. These photons build up to form a laser light. Once we excite the atoms or pump the atom from lower energy state to higher energy state, we can achieve the stimulated emission. Few electrons may come back to the ground state by releasing a photon. This photon will interact with other excited metastate atoms and release more photons. Few other excited atoms may come back to the ground state by releasing a photon due to the spontaneous emission. The photons will excite them back to the metastates. This process builds up and we'll have many unidirectional photons. In order to use these effects, we should have atoms in an active medium or laser cavity. We also have two mirrors on each side of this cavity. The mirror on the left is 100% reflective whereas the mirror on the right side is partially reflective. The atoms will be in a different energy states. We can supply the energy to the atoms through electrical power or shining a bright light. This will make the atoms to reach higher energy states. When some of the atoms release the photons through spontaneous emission, they can travel in any direction. However, the photons which are perpendicular to the mirror will keep on reflecting back and forth. In this process, the photons will excite few more atoms and cause stimulated emission in many atoms. So, we get a large number of photons traveling back and forth in the laser cavity. This is highly directional and coherent light. As the mirror on the right is partially reflective, the laser light comes out. Inside the cavity, the photons act like a light wave. We'll have two types of waves. One wave moving towards the right and another wave moving towards the left. These waves interfere constructively if there is no phase difference between the two. And they interfere destructively when they have phase difference of pi radians. Due to this interference, we see a standing wave in the laser cavity. So, these are the different processes involved in the production of laser. Before we end this video, let us learn a few important terms involved in laser. They are pumping, lasing and active system. Pumping is the process of exciting the atoms from lower energy state to the higher energy state by supplying the energy from an external source. That external source can be a DC battery or any other power supply. The next term is the lasing. The process which leads to emission of stimulated photons after the population inversion is achieved is known as lasing. Moving on to the final term, the active medium. Between the energy levels of this system or medium, the pumping and lasing action takes place. Now we know the prerequisites for the laser action to take place. The requirements of laser are an excitation source for pumping, an active medium which supports the population inversion and a laser cavity. This is all about laser. In the next video, we learn about CO2 laser.